All right, our next guest is no stranger to this world of cinema, or in fact, to any of us. He needs no introduction at all. But let's extend a warm welcome to the true titan of Indian cinema. From kuch kuch hota hai to Rocky Arani ki prem kahani, he redefined love and its storytelling for us. And now he's rewriting the definition of OTT and reality TV by producing content like Coffee with Karan and the fabulous lives of Bollywood wives. His contribution has shaped the narrative of contemporary Indian cinema. Please put your hands together and welcome Karan Johar. Good evening, everyone. The session is called "The New Order of Cinema." Good to have you here, Karan Johar. I want to start by asking, what does cinema mean to you? Sorry, <laughs> what does cinema mean to you? Cinema. Uh, that's a broad question to ask a filmmaker. Cinema is. Um, it means everything, actually, to me. It's my identity. It's. Uh, what raised me, it's what made me dream and eventually fulfilled so many of those dreams. Um, the very first film I ever saw in a cinema hall was a film called Roman Holiday. Uh, my mother took me to an early morning screening at the Eros Cinema at Churchgate and I remember being mesmerized by celluloid, uh, moving images and the the beauty and romance of that film, and I just fell in love with the whole, the whole community experience of watching a film. Uh, from then on, it just went on from one moment in cinema to the other when I discovered Indian cinema and Hindi cinema, and that's where the beginning of my dreams began. So cinema pretty much is uh, the fructification of so many of my childhood dreams and memories. Fantastic. But then I have to ask the question, when you make movies, do you see yourself as a businessman or an artist? And can you wear both the hats? And is there a clash of the heart and the mind sometimes? And do you think to yourself that this film has to be made? It may or may not work. I mean, because I was a producer's son, I was, uh, my father, Mr. Yash Johar, um, was a producer in a very different environment where I don't think a producer was given the, the kind of regard and respect that they are today. They, today they're studio heads and, you know, uh, heads of studios and, and, and production houses and like they're given a whole different regard. In those days, uh, producer was the lowest hanging fruit. Like one has heard of dramatic stories of houses being sold, jewelry being sold, when a film has failed at the box office. Uh, there, were, there were individual financers and there were high costs of interest and uh, so I have seen um, the, while I've seen art unfold in front of my eyes, I've also seen uh, the other side of things, you know, where I've seen like uh, the turbulent times commercially that my father had been through and the industry was going through. Uh, so I have an understanding of both and I believe that my own uh, tastes or rather my own preferences have always kind of blended the two of them. It's been a, a kind of a blend of commerce and art. I think, you know, I always think like that. Being commercial or being mainstream is pretty much a part of my DNA as a filmmaker. It's not something I have to cultivate or inculcate. It's within my ecosystem as a filmmaker. So when I design a film, by default, by design or by desire, they tend to be mainstream in texture. So there comes the commerce part of it. And as an artist, you always express yourself through the stories you tell, through the dialogues, through the narrative, through the communication or essence of the film. So I believe I've been able to balance it as a director. But as a studio head, as a producer, my eyes on the, on the box office ball, always. Um, that's how I believe a producer should be if you're in the business because we have responsibilities. Uh, we have partners, we have a digital partner, we have a satellite partner, we have a music partner. So you've got to deliver the goods if you're asking for top dollar from the market. It seems you, you found the magic formula. Are there boxes that you have to tick and say, okay, if this is the script that has come to me, it is definitely going to work if it fulfills these many criteria? Look, I don't know any filmmaker who can ever say that this particular film is going to be a, an assured blockbuster. 
we never know the thing about cinema and the thing about storytelling is you don't know how deeply resonant your idea will be with a wider audience you can just do your best and put in all the elements that perhaps you know of or your creativity uh, goes towards but eventually when a film is a massive breakthrough at the box office or is a massive failure both of them sometimes to a filmmaker is a big surprise <laughs> uh it comes uh sometimes as a shock when the film fails but also as a very happy surprise when it goes beyond your expectation because i believe the audiences act in extremes uh you can never really assess and they always we say consumer is king but it's very true uh, with a film because i believe an audience is empowered to know much before a filmmaker if the film or content excites them or not so it's like a lottery well it well lottery would still be putting a gamble to it because there's so much more to creating stories and and creating art than just gambling but it is kind of a creative gamble yes you've made some great films commercial successes uh, audiences the world over have loved them you've made films like my name is khan kabhi alvida na kehna some of these themes were perhaps ahead of their times would you be able to make a movie like that today and how do you think it would be received and would you make any changes to it well i believe you can tell any story you want if you have the courage of your conviction uh when i directed my name is khan it was at that point of time where i believe very strongly in talking about the misinterpretation of a religion worldwide at that time this was post 911 and uh, i felt very strongly about telling that story when i told kabhi alvida na kehna it was about emotional turbulence in many households across the world uh, infidelity is a reality and monogamy is um, a rarity <laughs> but uh many people told me how could you endorse infidelity at that time well i said how can you endorse something that's already sold out it's out there for the world to see and witness but many people were very um i would say polarized in terms of their reactions because there were many who addressed them as home truths and acknowledged them as realities of life and many others who didn't want to watch the reality of life they didn't want to see their biggest movie stars um showing shades of gray uh they wanted to see the model husband the model son the model the the model parent but kabhi alvida talks about people who live in the gray and uh that's not a shade and audience takes to very easily it takes a whole lot of evolution for them to understand those shades of of gray in humanity but as a filmmaker as a content creator as a storyteller you want to tell all kinds of stories and dabble in all kinds of themes and to go back to your question given a moment in time where i believe in something strongly i will be able to tell that story and i'm sure if it comes through with conviction an audience will definitely look into it at some point of time maybe not at the time it releases but somewhere down the line it will find acceptance I think that's very very important for any artist in any field to find that conviction and to to yes. go with it. Um since you're talking about the audience being divided and the audience having to evolve sometimes um a recent example that comes to mind is Animal. Uh it was very successful, also very controversial. Uh the movie was violent. How do you think such movies then impact society? Look, there's been a lot of debate on Animal. uh there have been people who have expressed their opinions and there are people who have stood up uh against for it i know the filmmaker himself has been very vocal about his feelings i personally i'm going to say very truly honestly i saw it as a character film a film based about a character who was deeply dysfunctional uh, who was inherently violent who had many emotional issues and i really loved the treatment of the film i loved the way the di- director told that story i didn't go deep into the moral communication of the film i was was so swept by the narrative and the way the filmmaker told the story with sound design screenplay dialogue character development that as a filmmaker i loved it and uh, i know i've been in deep debates 
um, you know, about the film with people. But that was my opinion as an audience, as a filmmaker. And I believe that a film that can shake up uh, the, the ecosystem of emotion where it releases is obviously impactful because so many people have so many opinions about the film. And um, I was just one of those people who loved it as a filmmaker. And there are people who've called me and, and expressed their opinions to me and, you know, disagreed with me or agreed with me. But I have to be honest about my emotion attached to a film I've seen. And, and if it comes with criticism or flack, then I'll have to accept it with open arms. And if it comes with some quarter of an embrace, I have to accept that as well. I think that's the thing with art. It evokes strong emotions. Cinema more so because it reaches so many more people. And given the reach that you have, do you think that there is at some level a moral ob obligation uh, on, on a director or an actor that, that the film should somewhere s strike a balance or, or set out the right message? Or is it not so black and white? It's not as black and white as that. What is communication to me through the medium of cinema may not be something that you endorse or agree with, but what I'm trying to say might be my belief. And I'll do it in my way. Of course, when I was writing Rocky or Rani Ki Prem Kahani, I knew that uh, there was so much I wanted to say because I was addressing patriarchy. I was addressing uh, entitlement. I was, I was addressing like divides in terms of, you know, love or um, freedom of an artist where a man can perform to a classical dance form and not be scoffed at. Um, I addressed that because that was the story I wanted to tell. Um, and I do believe that you call it moral obligation. I just talking, I talk about spreading love through your work and just spreading goodness. And that's what I wanted to do through that film. I didn't think that I sat on a chair as any kind of moral police. I just wanted to spread a good emotion, a feeling of love and unity through that film. And, and that's what I hope to do. But every filmmaker, he or her has their own perspective and it's their prerogative to have their own perspective. You know, I, uh, I can't speak for anyone else. Sorry. I can speak for myself. No, I, I asked because uh, back in the day there were, there were films with heroes chasing a heroine and her saying no and the man still persisting. And, and over the years we've realized that that may not have been the best, best message. So I think we also evolve in our thinking yes. as how we process it as a society, uh, which is why I asked that for someone who's been making movies for so long, do you, you know, think that... Honestly, when we grew up in the lap of Hindi cinema and Indian cinema, a lot of, a lot of the, the, uh, the communication was unknown to many of us. What we consider was romance. Later on, we realize it's talking and it can have, you know, deeply, um, it can have deep repercussions. Uh, but none of this was when I was growing up. We didn't realize a lot of it. It's on the job you realize your responsibility. It's for you individually to kind of feel responsible to an audience. It's your, as I said, it's your prerogative. I can't speak for anyone else, but I know that I wouldn't represent an item song the way I have in my films maybe 10 or 12 years ago, uh, because I know it would amount to objectification. I know that having a man relentlessly chase a woman without her consent is not romance. It is stalking. I know that today, but I've learned on the job. You know, and I don't want to be cancelled for it now, but like I did learn on the job and I, I admit to not knowing a lot then and being much more emotionally aware today. I appreciate how candid you've been with this. Uh, let's talk about OTT because we're talking about the new order of cinema. How do you think OTT has changed cinema? Has it democratized it? Has it, has it given uh, filmmakers uh, uh, more avenues to experiment and the viewer and the audience also to, to evolve in their tastes? You know, there's been this whole debate about has, has OTT platforms, have they caused a dent in theatrical audiences? And suddenly we saw the resurgence of the box office in 2023 and everyone said, oh, has OTT slowed down now and is cinema back? Uh, nothing has changed. Both complement each other. It just means OTT has given birth to what I believe is the most powerful resource of storytelling is the storyteller, the writer. OTT has empowered writers, and that to me is so gratifying to know that today writers stand empowered because OTT is predominantly a writer's medium. And because we have 
writers being empowered. There are more of them writing more and more content and such superior content that I think films are benefiting as a result of that. Also actors. There are such fine actors in our country and now they've found platforms to have lead roles which sometimes they have to succumb to the star system and are unable uh, to find their space in the spotlight. But now all of them are doing incredible work and we have access to those actors, those writers, those storytellers. So the OTT platforms have expanded the horizon of entertainment to an altogether different level. And I think cinema is benefiting from this growth. And OTT also, when you have licensed films on OTT platforms, those platforms are also exponentially enhanced. So one is helping the other. They're working like, like siblings. They're not at war, but like they're very much like complementing each other's strengths and offsetting their weaknesses. Are there any particular genres that, that necessarily work better on the big screen and not OTT? If you were to make, or whenever you make your next movie, how are you going to decide where it should release? So the thing with watching the middling content in terms of the dramedy, the romance comedy, the human drama, the ones that are told in engulfed spaces and spaces that are not able to be told in a cinematic way, those stories are now much more tilted towards the OTT platforms because now people are going to watch big theatrical experiences in the cinema halls. They want to watch tentpole films, big event films, cinema experiences. So I think we have to understand that there will be the, the 12th fail that will come and suddenly shake that up. There will be films like that, but they may be few and far between. Predominantly, I think the big screen will be for big screen, big cinema experiences. And OTT platforms will talk about genres such as I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll have to understand that very carefully when we forge forward. Let's talk about the N-word, nepotism. I know you've fielded a lot of questions on that. And uh, the fact is that nepotism has existed for centuries and across industries. But for some reason, Bollywood gets a lot of flack for it. Uh, do you think that Bollywood is unfairly targeted? Do you think that you guys are soft targets when it comes to politics or public opinion? It's easy to take pot shots at film stars and filmmakers. Look, I think the movie industry in Bollywood, if you may call it, has always been a soft target because everyone's out there for everyone to see and judge on a daily basis. Um, Bollywood is in your face morning, noon, and night. So anything attached to Bollywood always becomes a soft target. Uh, nepotism exists in our ecosystem, in our traditional system, in our business domain, in every field and walk of life. Um, of course, it is an exaggerated uh, phenomena where it comes to our movies. Uh, and I do believe that there is some the truth to the entitlement and privilege that nepotism comes with. You have a first mover advantage that millions of others don't have. And that is true. I would not be able to direct a film at age 24 if my father was not a producer. The fact that he was a struggling producer and having a tough time was a separate issue altogether, but he was still in the business. And I got that first move advantage. But had that film failed, I would not get another ch chance. And that's true to any actor, artist, director, filmmaker. And I think that when you look at a film set, if you just go by sheer data, on a film set, if there are 500 people, I can assure you 490 of those 500 people are not from the business at all. They have nothing to do with the business. 10 people are, and then you make such a hue and cry about then. What about the other 490 people? Similarly, in my office, if you walk in, we are about 600 to 800 people working at one point of time on multiple projects. 95% of those people are not from the movie industry. Not technicians, actors, technical teams, all forms of artists are not. But that tiny percentage is targeted and made into this big, big deal about. And I'm like, you know, what about the other kind of actors and directors who are not from the business and doing such incredible work? Why aren't you giving them the importance they truly deserve? Fair point. You also talked about mental health in your last season uh, uh, of Coffee with Karan. It's a topic that uh, most people shy away from, do not acknowledge. What made you come out and speak about it? I felt it was important because I felt that we realized that uh, people who come, uh, who live in the public domain or public figures, 
have, a, and especially the ones in the entertainment business, have a certain kind of life, lifestyle, emotionality. But just like anyone else, like everyone, like you go through mental health issues, and I know I went through them myself. I had a deep, uh, I still am, um, I'm on medication as I speak for anxiety, and I consult a psychologist, and uh, it is a result of whatever the story may be, but it is true that you're going through something that you don't know how to combat. And it's important to tell the world around you that if you can treat yourself for diabetes, for blood pressure, then you can treat yourself for mental health because it's also something that sometimes may require addressing, either through therapy or through a psychologist, through medication or maybe other avenues that you can uh, dabble in. But it is the truth of life, whether it's depression or anxiety or all strains of mental health, they need to be addressed because we live in troubled times emotionally as well as we do professionally and personally and and sometimes you have to take care of yourself your mind and brain needs as much love from your, you yourself and your loved ones as do other organs in your body and uh, we tend to put a taboo attached to it uh, and I think that it's very essential that we wake up to the fact that it is a reality of our life and addressing it would be the first step towards overall wellness and well-being of humanity in general. I think it's very important that, that people with your reach and your, uh, your celebrity status come out and say this. I think this deserves a round of applause. I think it's very important. Uh, your movies share a common theme about friendship, love, relationships. Have you considered exploring new genres like maybe a spy thriller? Uh, we are making many. Uh, they're all being uh, made or are going to release soon. We have lots of action-packed movies, uh, not essentially spy thrillers, but like we are, we're dabbling in different forms of, we're like we have a, a high-octave action film that is based on a moving train that we premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's just a film much like Train to Busan, which is the whole action is on a vertical format in a moving train shot by a Korean team for us with a new lead who's an outsider uh, and a director who's again an outsider who's told that story. It's called Kill and it's one of the very many in the series we plan to make. So we're doing high and we have a film releasing this Friday called Yodha which is action on a plane. Uh, so we're covering all modes of communication <laughs> uh, with action and we're trying to kind of do it in as interesting a way as possible. Uh, we're trying to do high concept action films at Dharma and that's our big endeavor of the moment. Do you think we will uh, in the Hindi or Indian film industry see more franchise film trends like, like a universe? Like We're already of... seeing it. We're already seeing what's happened with the Yashrat Spy Universe. It's a phenomenal success and uh, we've seen it with, we're seeing it with the films made in the South that are creating universes. Um, there are filmmakers like Lokesh Kangaraj who are doing it so exquisitely. We're seeing the whole phenomena of sequels and universes being created as we speak and we're doing it our way, which is what is making it even more exciting and exhilarating. Dharma is also known to platform not just new actors, but also directors and writers. When you pick someone for a project, what is it that you look for in fresh talent? And how much of it is dictated by your relationship or friendship to those people? No, I mean, when I choose a filmmaker, it's always based on my instinct. I believe instinct is a superpower that all of us have. Uh, sometimes we over-intellectualize it. We uh, put other layers on top of it. But actually, hidden in all of us is a superpower called instinct. And when anyone walks in and tells me a story, in that moment, in the very first five minutes, I know if I'm sold or not. And I just know that this person will make a film for me or not. It's just something I rely on all the time. It's my first instinct. Uh, in Hindi cinema, uh, especially in the last century, I think every decade we saw a super superstar, you know, who is the superstar of today according to you, say the Amitabh Bachchan or the Rajesh Khanna of today and I ask because on this very platform Ranveer Singh previously said that he doesn't think that this generation of actors will see the sort of fandom that for instance the Khans did. So is the era of superstars over then? The superstar is the movie today. It's not the actor, it's not the movie star, it's the movie and beyond the movie now it's the audience. Uh, we have to know that 
the era of superstars when mr bachchan and mr dilip kumar doins like them mr sharukh khan salman khan amir um akshay and ajay and rithik they all came at a time where they were not exposed to so much that actors of today are with the kind of access that everyone has to movie stars because of social media there is a drop in intrigue there is a less mystery and mystique attached to that stardom those days people had no access when a movie star came somewhere and appeared out of nowhere it was like throngs of people just waiting to see their favorite movie star today you see them coming out of gyms you see them coming out of parties restaurants everywhere they're all around us uh you swipe and you just see them you know you're zooming into them you're watching every beat of their life unfold in front of your eyes how can there be mega superstardom with that kind of access it's not possible so it just leaves us to believe that the movie is now the superstar fantastic i know i've taken more time than i was allotted but how can i have a conversation with karan johar and not have a rapid fire round oh so dear. let me quickly take some questions with you which is the better film kuch kuch hota hai or my name is khan my name is khan ott or big screen your go to medium to watch movies big screen forever it's where my life began audience is the king yes or no yes commercial success or critical laurels which one do you prefer commercial success honest cinema in bollywood i've already asked you is a lottery yes or no sorry cinema in bollywood is a lottery yes or no cinema in bollywood is is like a lottery is <laughs> lottery uh maybe, maybe. <laughs> directors who say commercial success does not matter are fill in the blanks a line a karan johar movie is incomplete without fill in the blanks a song a dance and a chiffon sari one movie that you keep going back to as inspiration for me kagaz ke phool biden or trump well it's like devil in the deep blue sea uh and uh we are all going to watch that drama unfold very soon no matter what i choose darling america is going to vote who they want to and they'll have to suffer those consequences <laughs> your go to magazine forbes india or forbes india well when in india do what the indians do forbes india all the way thank you karan johar pleasure thank talking you. to you my pleasure thank you thank you karan i request you to wait back on stage and that was uh, truly the perfect conversation on leadership lessons and the changing dynamics of the world of cinema and thank you for openly talking about your mental health and the struggles that you go through because we all know that this is a topic that needs to move out of being a stigma right but i would now like to request vivek srivatsa who is the chief commercial officer at tata passenger electric mobility and amit kamath who is the chief commercial officer at tata motors passenger vehicles to join us on stage to give away the icon of excellence award to karan johar Please give him a big big round of applause. Congratulations Karan and uh, can we hand over a mic to him? Um <laughs> just a few words please. <laughs> I didn't realize I had to give an acceptance speech. Sorry about that. Um this is wonderful it's such an honor coming from um forbes which is such an illustrious platform to receive an order, uh, an award and honor from and it says icon of excellence um i think that all a creative artist can do is constantly strive for excellence i'm not sure i'm quite there yet uh this is very humbling thank you very much so you know karan you yes one one more big round of applause but I have one more question for you. There are so many lessons that people learn from success, but I think the most amount of lessons that you learn is from failure, right? What has your biggest lesson been that you've learned from any failure that you've been through in the past? 
You know, I strongly believe as an entrepreneur or as an artist, um, it's important to, to kind of not give, um, to kind of, if you can, achieve the state of being where you can treat success and failure in the same way. If you don't celebrate your success too much or lament your failure too much, you're in a really strong place in life. Uh, I believe I meet, um, when, I, when anything is successful, I meet that with relief and I move on. And when anything fails, I learn and I move on. But it's important, extremely important to move on from both. Well, detachment, right? Thank you. All Thank right. You. Thanks a lot. And once Thank again, you. congratulations Thank on the award.